I want to let our listeners know that there's a way that you can help support our organization. If you go to our website at www.thisisfailingjustice.com, scroll all the way to the bottom of the homepage, and there you're going to find a donation link. Any amount you can donate will help us further our mission and reach more people. We believe it's really important to keep spreading the word about the issues that are plaguing our criminal justice system and how we can make it better. It is crucial to keep fighting for the change. And with your support, we can do just that. This is Failing Justice. Say something. Anything? Yeah. I don't Anybody know. out there? We're, we're trying to find out. Okay. All good now. Nope. All Sorry right. about that. Sweet. Technical difficulty. But uh, anyway, we're back. So I'm, I'm thankful that you're here tonight, man. Um, thank, thank you for being here. And um, what I was going to say was I, tr- I trust Compton's opinion. Um, he got out of law enforcement for a lot of the same reasons that I got out of law enforcement. And so um, I trust his opinion. Uh, I know kind of some of the things that he's done. Some of it he may talk about, some of it he may not. Uh, may just not name names, I don't know. But um, that's why he's here, because I feel like as law enforcement officers um, and even ex-law enforcement officers, we are here for change. That's what failing justice is about. I say it all the time. We are here to bring change. And what better way to bring change than talk to the ones that are within or were within so that's why Jason's here. He shares um, a lot of the same opinions, a lot of the same truths as to why our profession is the way it is. So, um, again, thanks for being here, man. Yeah. I think the first thing um, I think the first thing that I want to kind of dive into is um, how long were you in, and uh, when did you get out? So I started in the jail in like 2007. Um, uh, and it was sworn in, in 2011 and then left the profession in January of 2020. So I think somewhere around 13 years. Okay. Uh, math wasn't yeah, the strongest. And, and that was me. I went to, I went to work in the jail yeah. in, in 2007 and uh, then we went to the academy in 2010. Yep. So yeah, I mean, we kind of did, um, I got out in 21. So just about a year after you did. Um, so I mean, what was your what was your driving motivation to get out? Well, one was having a kid. You know, I grew up without a dad, um, and I had done all the cool things in the profession. I uh, put all the the bad guys in jail. I did everything right, um, and it got to a point where I felt like you know it wasn't worth dying for anymore, and I didn't want to put my kid in that position, uh, but also. I didn't want to influence my kid to want to go into the profession because I didn't want him to have to go through the things that I had been through. Um, You know, as I was telling you at dinner, I absolutely loved the profession. I loved the job. Um, But I got out of it for bigger reasons. Yeah. And I I feel you on the kid thing. Um, No doubt because uh, man, my youngest specifically, (sighs) I'll be surprised if that boy is not a police officer. Because even when I got out, you know, he, um, I mean, he was still all about it. Yeah. And, and I remember that's how I was when I was his age. So, I mean, I I, I definitely feel you um, yep. on the kid thing because it, it's hard. It's hard just to, to say, hey, we don't want you to do anything noble because we know what, what right. happens. You yeah. know, it yeah. kind of it kind of sucks to have to yeah. say that. But um, so... Obviously, we talked. We we don't want to just be negative, you know. We want to talk about the positive because there's a lot of a positive things about law enforcement. So I guess I want to say start off by asking you, like, what what were some of the positive impacts that the profession made on your life before we touch negative? Because there's plenty of negative. So plenty of negative. I mean, what yeah. what were the positive things that you could just kind of think off off the top of your head that you know you felt like molded you, shaped you, and and it was worth it. I mean. You can share the same experience. We both went in as kids. Yeah. We didn't know anything. We weren't mature. Um, it molded us into men, you know, um, faster than you would like. 
Yeah. I feel like I'm much older than I really am uh, for many, many reasons. But, you know, it, that was great. It turned me into the man that I am today. Uh, it taught me an endless amount of life skills. It taught me how to deal with a lot of different things, um, good and bad. And I got to do some really good things, you know, like the highlight of my career was working child abuse uh, for quite a few years. You know, you you take a, a drug dealer to jail and everybody's going to say, oh, it's just weed, right? Like they're yeah. knocking it. They're, they're, they're watering it down that you put someone who committed a crime in jail but nobody ever did that against child abuse. Um, so it was extremely rewarding to see those guys go to prison that really, really needed to be off the streets. Um, yeah. I mean, that was, that was Whoa. my driving force. The whole career was, was getting to do that. And once I left that role is when I started to kind of fall out of love with it because I didn't have that, you know? Well, I think, you may agree with this. There are some guys that go into the profession and not that they're bad people and not that their goals are bad. Um, there are some guys that want to just go and work patrol and that's what they want to do. And they're, they're totally fine with that. Yep. Um, but for me and obviously you too, you know, patrol can get really, it's a very important, I think it's the, the most important role of an agency. It's the backbone without patrol. You don't, really have a police response exactly and so i don't i don't i don't want to knock patrol but it was it was not my place to be there forever yes you know i I, I wanted to do more i felt like um there were not only just for myself and you know my personal goals but um there's only so much it seems like you can do on patrol you know, oh yeah, you're extremely limited, and yeah. it's it's redundant. You're doing the same thing every day. You're going to the same calls in the same areas, dealing with a lot of the times the same people. Yeah. Um, it gets kind of monotonous, uh, and it, it's just the normal day to day. Versus, you know, being in investigations or being on a tactical team, you get to see different things and do different things all the time. Um, I personally like pushing my cognitive ability to the limit to see what I could do and figure out. Um, that was just kind of what made me tick. Yeah. And I, and I can share your passion, um, with the child crimes because, um, now I don't know if you asked for that. I didn't ask for it when it, when it happened to me, but when, when I did receive it and that was where the cases that I were, that I was working, uh, you know, um, I just fell in love with them. Um, now I will say, obviously, I think on the flip side to that, subconsciously, that will eat at you. Um, I mean, dude, uh, you had kids at the time, right? Yeah. So I didn't. So it was a little different for me. It was motivating to me. And now that I have a kid, if I had to go back and do it, it would be a completely different ball game. It, yeah. Because I mean, you just, it's the nastiest. Yeah. And the most vile things that human beings do are hurt innocent children. And to sit there and um, have to watch those things, see those things, hear those things, get in small, tiny rooms with those people and pretend like you think what they do or what they did was okay to receive the confession. That way they can be put away where they where they deserve to go. And after doing that, I mean, it could be kind of taxing after a while. Um, it mentally, it, right? I mean, how, how did it changes the way you see things? So for example, you know, I, I did that for quite a few years and you're seeing the worst of the worst. It's the worst crimes on the board happening to the most vulnerable people. And then you move on to another agency or you go back to the patrol division and someone gets robbed. Right. And you, you go to the robbery and you're, you're not compassionate because you're like, this really isn't that bad compared to what I dealt yeah. with last week, you know? And I kind of felt that coming to me, uh, that, you know, insensitivity, uh, for a lack of better terms, that's just kind of, if you see the worst of the worst, everything else is not that bad if it's not happening to you, but it might be the worst thing that's ever happened to that person. Yeah. Uh, so that made it pretty tough to transition. 
No, and and I'm trying to think. Um, I, I did for a short time during my transition from Gladewater to um, back to Palestine. I'll say when I went back to Palestine, I did work patrol for a short short amount of time. And I agree with you. It was like, you know, um, just a lot of mental mind games that the profession as a whole plays on you. Um, but specifically, you know, when you, when you're working those crimes, but it was crazy because that was what I, I just found myself being really good at that. And going back to what I said earlier, like you and I were able to kind of, uh, it's kind of cool. We were able to collaborate and work a few. I mean, it wasn't anything major, but, um, I could see your passion and, you know, we were able to kind of share a lot of things and during that time. And so, um, when, when, when you go speaking of, I mean, cause we're already talking about it, yep. but speaking of negative things, um, and that could be a wide range of things, whether it be internal, external, whatever. But like, if you had to sit here, <laughs> if you had to sit here and say, you know, these are the negative things that, you know, affected me, affected my family, affected my mental health. What would some of those things be? External pressures and internal pressures, and you're sitting right in the middle of it, trying to pretend like you're not stressed. You know what I mean? Like you're dealing with the external politics and the external negativity, and then you would think that when you're inside the walls of the police department that it shouldn't be like that, and it's the same thing, just in a different lens from internal issues um, that make it so frustrating. Um you know, in the department that I finished my career at before I went to the private sector was, I mean, I worked for three different agencies in my career. You know, I started in the county jail, but the last agency was the best agency I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, loved it. I loved every minute of it. Uh, it just, it was time to move on. So let's talk about that. What made you love that agency versus the other one? Um, was that a... And I think I know what your answer is going to be. You know, I didn't prep you for this. What was it? There were no, that I saw, there were no long lasting interpersonal relationships within the department versus, you know, the, the first agency that I was a police officer at, everybody knew everybody I mean, everybody knew everything about everybody. Everybody had their buddies. There were it was real clicky. Um, you had the quote unquote good old boys. And then the last department I went to, like like I told you earlier, like every time I went to the jail, I saw a new officer that I never met before. Right? Yeah. So that that stuff wasn't there because you're just there doing your job, serving, and you're doing it with other like minded people. Um, it was the way you were treated. So so the culture was, was totally different. 100%. So, and, and, and that is one of the things, especially with having other law enforcement officers on the show, um, for us to provide a pristine service to the community that, that we're working in as police officers, for us to be able to do that, there's a couple of things that we have to have. One would obviously be proper equipment, the tools for the job. Yep. Um, that's a given. But the other thing has to be the backing. We have to have, and, and, and so, some people disagree with this, but I think that the Thin Blue Line Brotherhood is jagged. Um, to a degree. And what I mean by that is, and you can, I'm, I'm always for, you know, dialogue here, whether you agree or disagree. What I mean by that is there's an internal battle between agencies, whether it be, you know, from administrators or to first line supervisors or even just slick sleeve cops. There is an internal battle that, I feel like, at least in my experience, and in talking to a lot of other people, that hinders our ability to go out 
and do our job. And if you have somebody within, job's already hard enough, right? We talked on it just, just briefly, like doing the job is hard. You know, whether you're working child crimes or, you know, if you're on midnights and, you know, you're working a traffic accident where there's, you know, family members that are dead, babies, you know, you're away from your family. Um, man, the job in general is not for the weak, right? No. But then when you have the, you add on a layer of internal problems, internal battles that are just totally unnecessary. And I'm not saying, yeah. I mean, in your job in the private sector, dude, there's, when anytime you're dealing with people, you're dealing with problems. Anytime. 100%. Yeah. And in any pl- employer, you're going to have internal exactly. problems. But like I told you earlier, like when I left, the field, the first job I went to was a major bank as an investigator. And I was like, Oh, finally, you know, something different. And then I realized it's the same thing because my entire chain of command was old retired law enforcement. And I was like, I'm trying to get away from that. It wasn't the profession. I was trying to get away from that old culture. Yeah. Um, that some people will disagree, but to me, I felt like was toxic to my mental health. Um, it stressed me out and pushed me to my limits and I was tired of it. And, and, and that, that word, I kind of want to just take it and put it in the spotlight because will likely be most of our conversation tonight is the culture of law enforcement and how that culture has been the same since the dawning of day of policing And we've pushed it along and we've pushed it along and we've pushed it along, kind of like kicking the can down the road without implementing real changes. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of angles to that. Um, There's a lot of fronts to that, you know, politics being one of them. You know, we, we kind of chit chatted a little earlier about politics and that goes – that politics runs from the very top. You you look at how right now in our country, how they are weaponizing our top law enforcement agencies, the FBI, the DOJ, to go after and silence those that are in politics – because they disagree with their stance. They've exposed something. And if they're doing that at the top level, I always say this, what makes you think that's not going on in at these agencies that we work for? Well, think about it. You got the, the policy manual that explicitly states that you can't really say anything on Facebook that may in a subjective way, misrepresent the department's values. So all that says is if you're a cop and you have Facebook, be careful what you post because they're going to use it against you, yeah. right? So the first thing all my buddies said to me when I got out of law enforcement was like, how does it feel to have your freedom of speech back? You know, you can only say things that are within the policy. So like the policy governs your personal life because they – Attach that to the department in some capacity. And, it's bizarre. And I'm, 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 f- I'm for policy, right? Like, obviously, there's got to, right? If somebody's going to say something stupid, right? Then by all means, right? Yeah, yeah. But I, I've seen people get in trouble for pennies on the dollar. I so, mean, it's so you, just you, 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 silly stuff. You said values going against the department's values. My question in so many areas are, what are the values? And it's almost as if that policy is made up and it's twisted and they're coming up with with new values all the time, conduct on becoming. They're always vague enough to fit whatever it wants to be fit to. Right. I I know a guy. um, He's in East Texas. And um, he was on, you know, when you first start in a law enforcement agency, you're on probation, six months, a year, whatever. And they tried to pin him down on something um, 
I won't go into details. It's not really my story to tell, but they tried to pin him down on something um, totally superficial, untrue. Well, then the next thing you know, during their investigation, they find out that it was it's untrue. Like they reached the point that it's untrue. And it just so happened to be that one of the persons making this complaint was related to the fire chief. The fire chief and the police chief were friends. So they found out that what they were claiming that he did was untrue. But he's on probation, right? In the same meeting that they tell him, hey, um, yeah, this is unfounded. You know, there's there's no there's nothing here. There's no merit to what we initially put you out of work for a week for. Um, but just so you know, you're on probation and uh, your paperwork's just been a little rough lately. You know, you hadn't been doing this. You know, you've been told to do this. And so it's just not a good fit for us. And um, so we're going to, you know, we're just, we're just it's just best that we part ways. But we'll give you a good recommendation, you know. Um, this is, this is, uh, anybody that calls will will give you a great recommendation. And I'm just sitting there and I remember this guy called me and he was asking for advice. This was before I came a cop again. But, but hold on a second. If you truly did something wrong, why would they give you a good recommendation? That's what I'm saying. They just don't want you at that agency. They don't want to deal with you because it's political, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, it goes back to this person was related to the fire chief. Well, it's, it goes back to don't piss off the wrong person. Yeah. Because if you get on that list, you can't get off of it. No, and and that's what I was talking about. Like when we were when we were walking here, we we kind of were briefly discussing um, a little bit about uh, like you just said, pissing off the wrong person, and the few reasons why cops leave police agencies. You know, I said one of their shady. Two, if they want to leave because they're just tired of the BS. I can't remember what the other one was. Or they get forced out. Or they get forced out. Yeah. That's what it was. Yeah. Or they get forced out. So usually when cops, th- those, are th- those are the main three reasons why. Especially when you see a, a veteran officer just randomly retire out of <laughs> nowhere, you know they got pinned in a corner. Yeah. And, 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 and there's so many, you know, I... A lot of people say, man, you just use this show to bash cops. And that's not the case, man. Like, There's so many good cops out there. You're right. The, I mean, I'm not kidding you. Like 99.9% are so good. They may not be good cops, but they are good people yeah. trying to be good cops. Right? Trying to do good things. Um, there's a very, very small percentage of dirty cops out there doing bad things intentionally. But you got to think about how hard this job is. You're You're fighting battles on a street. To turn around and come fight battles in your own house. Yeah. Like, you can't win. And, and to, then people wonder why these these people lose their mind. Yeah. You know? And to me, I mean, you said it, like the battle from within, to me, is the hardest one. I mean... And don't get me wrong, it's not like that at every department. The, the department I finished at, I didn't have any internal battles at all. I had no problems at all. I loved everybody that I worked with. Um... You know, if I didn't have a kid, I'd probably go back and work there. I mean, I absolutely loved the place and the people. It's a fantastic department. It's one of the best in the state. Um, but I've seen it from both sides. But what do you think? Um, what do you think are some of the reasons why the culture is the way it is in a lot of police agencies and why it's that way? from generation to generation, decade to decade, why does it never change? Well, think about the the generations and the decades. Who are the people rolling up in command? The people that were taught by the prior command staff, right? And where are all these people taught? They're all taught at one special school, maybe two in the state, you know, that teach you how to be a leader. You know, and there's some leaders out there that they've got a brain on them and they know kind of how to treat people that's not telling you by a book how to do it, right? But if everybody's going by the same book, 
and that's being passed down year after year after year, maybe we should look at the book. <laughs> you know, where's the common denominator there? No, I agree with that. Um, I think... Because there's some great police leaders, great ones. I've had more bad than good, um, in my opinion, based off my experiences, but there are a ton of good ones out there. Um, you know, I never worked for Dallas PD, but I follow Dallas PD closely and Chief Garcia, I think he's doing great things. Yeah. You know, I mean, of course, some of the Dallas PD officers might say something different to me, you know, (laughs) but I mean, just outside looking in, knowing what I know about the field, I think the guy's doing great. You know, I'm actually, um, you remind me, I'm, I'm actually going to try to get him on this podcast. Oh, that'd be cool. If, if he'll agree to that. Yeah. I, I don't know if he will. Um, but I've I, never I, met him, but I agree if you do, you. I would like to come up here and meet him because he, he seems like a really, really sharp guy. I do agree with you. I think he, you know, but you have to, here's the deal. And, and just to kind of take a sidestep for a minute, the general public, you know, they're going to see one thing and one thing only. They're going to see when the cops screw up. Mm-hmm. But it's real though, right? Like, I'm not saying that they shouldn't have that opinion because they should. Um, I mean, look, Richard Miles sat where you sat just a couple weeks ago. Um, did 15 years in prison because of lousy police work. Um, and so he said something that I have latched on to that I think is extremely important in police work. Vulnerability. Okay. And admitting your mistakes because historically the police, they are human. They mess up. Any human messes up. Okay. It's just, they have a more, um, they're in the public eye more and what their mess ups can be so much more they're amplified. Yes. They're amplified. They're, they're, they're more important. Yeah. And what I think should be done on the regular. And a lot of people don't practice it is being vulnerable. When you do screw up, pause in the game and saying, Hey, you know, we messed up. We didn't get this right. Um, and we're going to do what we can do. Here's what we're going to do to make it better. And there's not a but lot of that But usually if there's happens. a mistake, it boils down to, oh, the department didn't make the mistake. The officer oh, yeah. did. Let's get rid of the officer, right? Yeah. It's never the department taking ownership or responsibility for their officer messing up, which officers mess up. It's the nature of the beast, right? Um but they just leave these guys and girls hanging out to dry. Yeah. Like own it. You taught them. <laughs> they need a, they, they need a scapegoat. Yeah. They need, they need somebody, um, to blame. Of course it can't be poor policy. Mm-mm. It can't be poor training. You know, it's never poor leadership. It can't be poor leadership. Yeah. It's gotta be that officer, you know, they violated X, Y, Z policies. Yeah. And, and I just think, I truly mm-hmm. think that, if in the profession of law enforcement, we can do better at saying, hey, we messed up because cops in general, I mean, we don't like to, I mean, we don't like to admit when we're wrong. We have, well, we're, we're taught that we can't be wrong. Right. Because if you're wrong, you're putting somebody in jail that shouldn't be in jail. If you're wrong, you're going to get killed. You've got to be wrong. You've got to be right all the time. And they teach you that. In the very academy There's that you and I went to. Zero room for error. Yeah. It's the nature of the beast. Like, it is what it is, you know? And then it, it becomes programmed into you to where you feel like you have to justify everything. Um, and that even would, like, roll over into my personal life. Like, any arguments at home, I'm, I'm over here trying to justify <laughs> it, right? Um, it just becomes ingrained in you until you get out and you can see it from a distance and you're like, it all makes sense. Dude, you said it. Like they teach you, you were taught, you were the, you were the police. No, no, that's what they say. You were the police. At least in East Texas. At least in East Texas, yeah. (laughs) And you, um, you're in charge, always. What you say goes. And so it's like, 
it's like that is just embedded in your mind from the moment you graduate and you go out there thinking you're 10 feet tall and bulletproof and you're right about everything. And then you're, how many hours in the police academy did we have on conflict resolution? Ah, oh, man. They don't. It's not in my training history. No, they don't. Um, you know, I think since since that academy, we have had some. It's totally changed. To, you know, we've had some de-escalation yes. training. But even then, think about the guys that are teaching. <laughs> think about the guys that are teaching this de-escalation training, right? Um any any training that I've gone to, minus s- some extreme advanced training, you're in there to satisfy a requirement. 100%. To the state has mandated something, and now you have to take it. If you want to keep your job. If you want to keep your job and your license mm-hmm. before a certain date. Right. So they're just trying to herd everybody through and get that mandate. And so you have those instructors... And most of the time, man, I would say about 80% of any T-Cole training that I've ever attended, they essentially give you the answers to the test. Oh, it's it's a definitely uh Yeah. If I raise my hand when I say this, you need to remember it kind of thing, which it is what it is. You know, I, when I was an instructor, I never did that, uh, but I've seen it happen. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean that people aren't getting things out of the course that they need, but I mean... Think about as an adult, when you go to a training course, course, are you really like taking notes and paying attention to everything that's being said? No. Well, that's the thing, man. Half of those cops either got to work that night or, you know, got off at 3 a.m. before so they could get, you know, four hours of sleep. Um, And it's just. But it absolves the department from liability because they can say we put it on paper that they had the training. Doesn't mean that they're good at it. It just means they sat through the class. Yeah. And I don't think that's a really good way to go about it. Now, I understand, like, they've got a department to run and they need people on the street, right? But, you know, you got to make sure your people are proficient. Sometimes, Um, sometimes I feel like, you know, I don't always know what the answers are. Like, I do this show because I gave up to now most of my adult life to this profession. Yep. You know. And I'm passionate about it. I'm not sitting here saying I have all the answers and I know exactly what what to do. But I can sit here and say, I've seen this, I've seen that, I've seen this, and I've seen this, and I know that's not what we should be doing. Um, And sometimes some of the things like emails and stuff I get, and comments from people like, you know, like I'm just Mr. I... I don't. I'll, I'll sit here right now. I, I try to check myself and remain a humble person. But this show, this podcast, this organization is just to to bring awareness and try to have these conversations because are people having these conversations? I think a lot of these conversations happen um, on Saturday night when we've rented the fight and you got a bunch of your buddies, you know, um, you know, sipping on some Coors Light or whatever, and they're sitting there bitching about um, the department. You could call my wife right now (laughs) and ask her in my 13 years how many times I had my buddies over and what we talked about the whole night, and all we did was complain about the department. Yeah. Or we would talk about stupid calls that we had to deal with, something like that. Like we we never – all my friends were cops because I didn't want to have friends with other people, right? Uh, and that's all we did was talk about the toxic things that we dealt with because we related. Yeah. You know? And, and if you were to have those conversations, um, that's where those conversations have to take place because they can't take place on a platform like this. Um, I always go back to when I sit down with Richard Miles, him telling me, Hey, you're literally, you know, I've been through a lot of things talked to a lot of people. I've been on CNN. I've, you know, I've been on some pretty big stages, but you're literally the first cop that has opened the door to have this conversation with me. And again, I was like, I told him, I was like, man, that's pretty cool. Right. But at the same time, man, it's like extremely um, disheartening because why are we not having these conversations and why, when these, why do, when these conversations happen, 
why is there so much always refer back to the Homer Simpson meme where he's going off in the bushes? Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't, when I was on the patrolman's board, okay. We would say, what are all the problems you want us to bring up and deal with? And we would get all the problems. And then it's like, okay, well, how many people do you have? And you go, who wants to raise their hand? And there's crickets. Everybody's afraid. Because they're scared. They're scared. And man, I've been out three years, over almost four years. And you still haven't heard me name an agency yet. No, I know. Because I've seen retaliation with my own eyes. And it has molded how I speak. I think a lot before I let mm. a word out, right? Because um, you never know. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, I know that they can't touch me because yeah. I don't work there anymore. But, dude, it's just, it's bizarre. Well, and, and that's why people tell me all the time. They're like, we're really concerned about your safety. And, you know, like, I, I, like are you sure you want to say that? And, and, and so, but you're right. The majority, um, I'm not sure what got into me. Um, I can't answer that question exactly. I think I was just totally fed up. And I said, nobody's doing this. Nobody's having these conversations. We're not. Well, it's almost therapeutic. Yeah. You're like You finally get to get it out. Yeah. Because I couldn't tell you how many guys have called me and been like, how did that feel to be able to say that? You know? Yeah. Without getting in trouble. It's like, it's kind of cool. And know? there's, man, there's a ton of, of officers that are still friends of mine that I've reached out to. And I'm like, hey, um, do you want to come on the show? You know, they're like, oh, no way, dude. Like, I, we, are you crazy? Well, even when you asked me, I was just like, <laughs> oh, I don't really want to do this. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And, and that's because. And it's, it's, it's all good intention. It's good intention. Yeah. And, 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 and that's why I always try to make it as clear as I can possibly make it. It sounds redundant, but I want this show to not be perceived as. You know, I want this, like you said, good intentions. What I want to come out of this show is real change. And well, you've got to, we've got to change like the way the, the police and the public engage, right? For obvious reasons, like there's problems there yeah. with relationships. Um, but you also have to change how a lot of these departments treat their people. You're asking them to do a really, really tough job. And if you're not treating them well, and I'm not saying treating them well, like protecting them, right? But treat them right. Yeah. You know? And that goes back to, we kind of got off of it a little bit. That goes back to leadership, right? Yeah. So my last agency, if you're involved in any critical incident or you see something extremely traumatic, you go through a therapy session the next day. It's mandatory. The department before that, you better be at work on time. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it's just different. And that's, that's why I have nothing but good things to say about the last agency that I worked for. Um, they took they, care of you. They, well, they took care of you. They cared. Uh, and it's funny, you know, when I got there, a lot of the people that have been there 15, 20, 30 years, they're grumbling about all kinds of things. And there's a lot of laterals that go to that apartment for a reason. And all of us laterals are like, guys, this ain't bad. Like it could be way worse. Trust me. I came from it, you know? Yeah. Um, and where I started and came from was it's a good department with good people, but crappy leadership. And, and, and that's where it begins. And it goes back to, you know, if you have attended what, what most cities look for, if you've attended Lehman law enforcement management Institute of Texas, which I've been there, um, if you have a master's degree um, and you can tie a tie and look real fresh and go in and, 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 and speak some fancy words before city council, that's who they're going to select. That's what they look for. And I'm not saying those things are wrong. By no means am I, am I discrediting, um, you know, leadership training or education, but it's not always doesn't always mean that's the right person for no. the job. You can't just look at paper. You got to look at the person. Um, and I'll tell you a story real quick that 
it's going to kind of blow your mind, right? Yeah. And I won't name anybody, but he's going to know who he is if he listens at all. Um, <laughs> hey, there's a lot of people that listen to this that don't like it. So. I had an assistant chief one time. Uh, there were some ladies from the advocacy center that delivered some cookies to a couple of us detectives. Um, this particular assistant chief got the cookies out of the lobby for us um, and sent us an email to let us know that the cookies were there. Said, hey, so-and-so dropped cookies off for you. Uh, they're sitting in CID. Thanks. Oh, I took one for my troubles. Thanks. And he signed the email, Daddy. Keep in mind, my dad's dead. No. Signed the email, Daddy. Daddy. Signed it, Daddy. And he was my assistant chief at the time. And, like, it was one of those guys where, like, you always kind of make joking comments, but you always know they're halfway serious. Um, and there was always a little bit of tension in the air. Um, and then sends an email like that. Just to let you know, like, that little thing yeah. to let you know, like, hey, um, I can say but, this. But I, what God if you forbid done that? you complain about it. Yeah. God forbid you go to HR like most people would in a normal workplace. You complain about it. Oh, you're just a complainer. You're a sissy, right? You can't handle it. And I never said a word about it, but I printed that email out and I saved it for a really long time. <laughs> um, but that's the kind of stuff, man. Like you don't treat people like that. It's, it's the, the leadership in this profession is self-serving. Very rarely in my experience and for what I've seen from afar, do you have a true and when I when I when I say leader I mean command level um yeah it doesn't always mean leader yeah <laughs> no yeah 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 I mean because we we both know yeah. that there are some really good um leaders that they don't even hold rank we're talking like six sleeve you know um, or just your random day shift patrol guy yeah might be a great leader just never had the passion to pursue management exactly you know but but i have rarely seen again when i say leader i mean command level chief assistant chief um captains be genuine it's they're most of the time self-serving and that is very much evident in their day-to-day -day interactions with their subordinates. Um, extremely evident. And those guys, and I put in one, of, in one of my notes here, is it's who you know. So you know Tyler was a civil service agency. Mm -hmm. Tyler PD, my, my, my agency was a civil service agency in Palestine. And so was Irving. Um, so like civil service agencies... Um, it doesn't matter. As long as you can pass a test, you're going to get a promotion. And beat the other people. You, you can literally, you know, score 71 versus a 70. And it don't matter. You're the next leader. It doesn't matter what you've got in your file, what kind of scoundrel you are, you know, how lazy you are, you know, how you treat your wife. None of these things matter. How you, how people view you, do they view you as a leader? Do they view you as a scoundrel? None of those things matter, but as long as you can pass that test, as long as you just get one, one question right, that's, that's just pre-made up questions that's been there since the 70s. It's how good can you study yes. while you're trying to do your job, because you obviously don't have time to do it when you're at home, right? It's how good can you study or how quick can you get the answers from somebody else? Yeah. And that's who we are promoting. Yes. Within. And then you have... To the, the police chief roles, um, same thing. A lot of agencies these days, uh, some promote from within, a lot don't. Um, and there's a double-edged sword with that too. Yeah. Because then you could just be picking your buddies, right? You might be picking the wrong people. You might be picking yes men, yes women, uh, someone that's going to do exactly what you want them to do. Um, so it's, it's really a double-edged sword. You never know what you're going to get. I'd almost rather take my chances with a test. <laughs> yeah. Well, going back to who you know, I mean, if you've been, your career, you've made it to where you can rub elbows with the right person, um, you know, your your political affiliations in the town, 
city. You know, if you have that backing, you know, I saw it, and you know, I don't have problems naming names. I saw it with my chief, uh, Mark Harcrow in Palestine. Um, he was a hometown boy. He talk about having power. Yeah, I mean, he 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 was his best friend was the district judge. Um, he he just put himself in those circles and those connections, okay? And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that necessarily. When it becomes a problem is when you start using those things to your advantage for gain. So the example here is the city manager knew at the time and they ended up running her off. But the city manager at the time knew that he probably wasn't the best choice. So what he did was, was he, he gathered the posse, his, his, his powerful friends, and they wrote letters. They came to city council. And they, because he was lobbying behind the scenes, you know. And they, hey, this needs to be the guy. This is our guy. This is our guy. But then look at all the hell that unfolded after the fact, all the embarrassment right. that came on the city, um, all the uh, um, just corruption that unfolded after the fact. But that's because look how the process was. Look who we chose. Um, that's why I like that I left from a larger department because I left the profession with less of a sour taste in my mouth. Um, I see a lot of that with smaller agencies and smaller towns, but in the larger agencies, they've gotten much bigger problems to deal with, or, you know, like a Texan would say, they got bigger fish to fry. Yeah. Um, it just, man, it's, it's. And, and dude, it starts from the top. Yeah. E everything. We talked about having a slick sleeve leader, a guy who. Well, not only does it start from the top, the top's not the chief. The top is the city manager. Right. It, yeah. So it starts there. City manager, city council, yeah. mayor. Um and and to me, that's when you see like these guys on the lower level, if they are they can be a true, genuine leader, a good person, and they see that this goes back to kind of like the retaliation thing. They see something that's wrong and they want to step in and they say, Hey, um, and they're pretty wise, and what they have to say is right. What they see is wrong. But you can't say nothing about it. As soon as you do, you're, you're finding yourself you're on a you're on a special list yeah. of never going to CID, never doing anything that you ever want to do at the department. You're on a list that you're on patrol for the rest of your career unless you leave. Um, I mean, when when I was leaving one department to go to another, I was told. I'd just gotten plain clothes officer of the year the year before. And they're like, Hey, you better hope you get hired at this other agency. Or you're going back to patrol. I heard that out of my supervisor's mouth, relaying what all one, one of the superior officers said, like all because of why you were trying to better yourself. Um, probably, you know, at all. I mean, or the fact that I was on the board, uh, that wasn't in favor of some things be a slew of different things yeah. you know and i've seen it happen i've seen it to happen to other people people get railroaded for opposing what the the upper leaders are trying to do yeah they get railroaded and a lot of times they people just silently leave oh yeah and, and you and you why do you think half of one of my departments is gone working for two other departments in the same county yeah because, because it's not a coincidence there no no absolutely not because these people they have to silently leave because if they don't, and even if they do sometimes, but especially if they don't, you know, we were talking earlier. I told you the story about the letter that put, put in my file after I left Yeah, because I didn't leave quietly. I stood up and I said, somebody has got to, to it's time to put our, to put our feet down and start. It's time to expose these things. It's start time to having these conversations, hence this podcast. And, but if you don't leave silently, 
you will have something follow you that could hinder you from getting hired on at another agency. See, I left silently and I remained silent until I was off probation at the next agency. Mm -hmm. The fact that I even have to think like that tells you everything you need to know. So why doesn't the First Amendment apply to police officers? Why, why, why do you, why do we have to be quiet and just go with the status quo? No idea. No idea. There's and, no answer for that. No, but that's what it is. Yeah. When you sign up and you're a police officer, and I understand. There are things that you shouldn't yes. say. And yes. there's good reason for the policy, but the policy gets abused. It does. Because I've seen people get in some serious trouble with days off for saying something or venting. Nothing negative about the department, but it was just enough to piss off the wrong person. Yeah. And then all of a sudden that policy fits that mold and they're getting days off for it. I've seen it. Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and, and. It, it, it's like if you when you sign up to be a police officer, your your First Amendment constitutional right is stripped away from you, and you know any time any any officer wants to rise up and exercise that right, it's like whack a mole. You know, you just well, you you swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the <laughs> truth. So help you God, yeah, right? Unless it unless it's against the agency, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um. So when we're fighting these internal battles, and I, I said this earlier, but I didn't directly ask you, but don't you think those internal battles are are definitely hindering our ability to go out and deliver the best service that we can deliver for the citizens that expect it? It hinders it. Well, for example, one of them is you go out, you got to, you know, cross your T's and dot your I's to get into a vehicle pursuit these days. I get there's risk factors, right? But if you're within those policies and anything goes wrong, they're going to look at your speed. If you're one mile and over where you're supposed to be, they're going to watch your camera to see if you actually ran a red light without stopping first. They're going to find something to write you up. So it's like, yeah, go chase these cars. But when you do, you're getting written up. Yeah. You better be ready. And if you get written up, you're losing all the privileges that you have on special units. I mean, it's, and they wonder, like when I went to my last agency who was very aggressive um, and really pushed for you to do good police work, they wondered why the first pursuit I got into, the guy drove off and I just got on the radio and said, he fled. (laughs) And everybody's like, why are you not chasing this guy? And I'm like, because I would have gotten written up in my last agency. Um, Yeah. It's, you're, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. You can't win. And what's crazy too when you're comparing one agency to another agency, I've always wondered why are we not being, why is this not the same across the, the board? Why are we, if, if, if we're not doing, and I get you have population, you know, there's a, there's a lot of factors involved, but I'm saying overall our policies, um, you know, even on the prosecution side, uh, you have one guy here in Dallas that possesses, um, you know, he has some meth on him or whatever. He goes to prison for 20 years. You possess meth in Tyler, Texas, Smith County, um, you know, you get probation. Like, and I'm not saying that exactly. but I you, don't know you, about now. You, you I get, think you, they got you, the right DNA You get what I'm saying. Why, yeah. why aren't things even across or, or the board? To use your same example, you know, in East Texas— you arrest somebody for possession of marijuana less than two ounces, they're going to jail. They're going to go through the system and they're going to do their time if it's applicable to their situation, right? Yeah. But you come into Dallas County, the law is the law, Justin. Like, yeah. It's against the law to possess less than two ounces of marijuana. So you're, you're sworn to enforce those laws and you go out and risk your life because we all know that where there's weed, there's guns. Yeah. Right. So you make an arrest for less than two ounces of marijuana. You give it to the DA's office in Dallas County, and they're like, hey, yeah, we're not going to prosecute it. To the point where it's like it molds the departments to where they have to like write a ticket for paraphernalia when you know it's a drug. Yeah. And then, and then, and then we're prosecuting people in Smith County for that. So 
That's my point. Why are it's, we? It shouldn't be different. Why are we not doing the same things everywhere we go, and the laws are not applied the same everywhere? Well, um, you've got U.S. law, you've got state law, yeah. Like it, and, and you then are, you've got policy that can be more strict but not more lenient. It's just, it's, and you better believe too, um, if you're a cop or were a cop. And you have stood up and you have um, gone against an administrator or whatever the case may be, they're going to come after you. They'll twist those laws, just like you said, the policies, the laws, whatever it may be. They're going to twist that to fit the situation. And if they can snag you for it, they're going to snag you for it. I and, think people under the general public underestimate how, the, how difficult the job is because you have to follow state law. You have to follow the code of criminal procedure. You have to follow internal policies. And you have to do all that while making the right decision. And then you have to do all of that making the right decision and not get killed doing it. Yeah. Like, that's tough. It's tough, Because you can follow the law and still violate policy. So you did everything right, but you violated one policy. Now you're in trouble at home, but not in court. It's just, it's so frustrating. It is, man. Um, and we wonder why departments are severely understaffed. We wonder why the response time for police is getting higher by the day. You wonder why you call the police when your house gets burglarized and they show up an hour or two later. Like, nobody wants to be a cop anymore. Nobody, man. People, I mean, you got two examples sitting right here, but we're just we're just two of many. And there's so many out there, dude, that want out but they don't know how to get out. Yeah, they don't know how to get out. They don't know how to transfer their skills to a private sector. Um, they don't know how to articulate it on a resume because no one's ever taught them that. And a lot of people in the private sector don't understand the skill set that comes with, with law enforcement. It applies to a lot of different things. A lot of situations. Um, but people get stuck. I couldn't tell you how many people from, from agencies have called me after I got out and they're like, can you get me a job? Dude, I try, uh, but it's tough. Yeah. But there's a lot of people that I was like, that guy's going to be a cop for life. Yeah, They'll call uh, me and be like, dude, I need out. You're right. Um, and then they're also, that's part of the culture too, is those from within like to feed you the negativity of what are you going to do? You know, what What can you do? Yeah. They, they hold that control over you. I can as, tell you how many times I heard – Grass isn't always greener. Yeah. Or, you know, when you get laid off, you can always come back. It's like, that's what they really believe. Like, that, that you can't do anything else. Yeah. And th those that carry that control um, and are negative, I'm not talking about the ones that, that, that want to get out. I'm talking yeah. about the ones that, um, you know, fight against the ones that want to leave, fight against them leaving and feed them negativity. Those guys are the lifers. They're closed minded. They're totally unhappy in life. You know, they they hate their home life. They hate their job, but they want to be there because they don't have the ambition or the confidence to go do anything different. And so they want to make everybody else's life miserable. Yeah. And th that's facts. I've seen it, man. Yep. Miserable cops trying to make those that want to better themselves miserable. Just like when you were. Leaving one well, a lot of it's probably to to jealousy another. too. It's probably a yeah. I, I can't do that, so I I'm gonna knock you down a level for you trying to do better for yourself. Um, it's a weird culture, man. And, and I'll tell you one thing. I read a book uh, right before I left. Can't remember the name of it. I've been trying to find it to refer to a buddy up in Boston that wants out. And uh, when you get out, like. You lose a lot of friends. Oh, yeah. Like, not that I've lost friends, but they yeah. don't call me anymore. They yeah. don't talk to me like I'm one of those guys anymore. It's like, it's just like you're gone. You know, I still have, you know, a couple handfuls of close buddies uh, that I talk to all the time, but like the majority of my friends were cops. And now the majority of my friends are friends that I went to high school with, you know? And, uh, yeah. And it's that's, different. It is, man. Like you, there's a transition of getting out that's very similar to getting out of the military. And that's what the book was about was getting out of the military and how it's a culture shock. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Because you, I mean, you said it. You said, "Hey, talk to my wife." On Saturday nights, when we rented the fight. You know, we were, you know, we didn't have to rent a fight. It, we were the fight. Yeah. It, <laughs> like you know what I yeah. mean? It was just that. I'm sure that that all the wives got sick of it, but yeah, because you just those they could have got in on the gossip themselves because they've heard it so much. Yeah, they knew the storyline. I know it, man, and and that's all you did on your days off. You got together with other cops, and you sit there and 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 you had conversations about cop stuff. And then when you when you transition out, and I I've said it before, you're right. Some of the best people that I have met in going to the private sector, man, like some of those people are my best friends now. Now, um, of course, I always there will always be people that are my friends that are cops, but. Um, you look at things in a different lens, man, and you and you're like, it's almost like once you're out, you can see color again. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. Absolutely, dude. Yeah, you see a lot of different things and from different perspectives uh, that you couldn't see before because you were just so consumed with it. I mean, it it was, I mean, it was everything. Like it was my blood like my DNA. And then now that I'm out, I'm just like, Oh, everything makes sense. I didn't carry my gun for two years. Dude, I didn't either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, tonight's the first time I've carried a gun on me in a long time. Yeah. And that's only because we're in downtown Dallas. Yeah. You, you better carry that gun down here. I, yeah. I make sure I always have mine, but uh, yeah, for, for, for two years, man, I, like, didn't, I didn't want, I didn't want to, I didn't want it anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, of course I wanted more guns. Don't tell my wife, but yeah. Um, no. Yeah. And, and it's just such a, Man, it's such a like it's such a weight lifted yes. off. Like I like there's different stressors in the private sector. Especially owning well, the business. Well, one of them is, you know, there's there's a lot of disorganization compared to where we come from where everything is extremely structured. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's SOPs on how to do everything. And then you go to the private sector and it's just not that way. Uh so that was a, a big adjustment too. But um yeah, it we went through, we didn't even talk about that and we both did the same thing. Yeah. No, absolutely, man. I mean, it's, it's a, it is, it's a, it's a breath of fresh air. Um, totally different lens. Like you said, I think you see color and, um, so your perspective start to change too, um, of how you see a lot of different things. I think, um, like when you're in it, like, you know, you know, this isn't right, you know, but you're led to believe that it is. And something inside of you is like, there's a fire burning. You're like, this yeah. isn't right. Like, I know this isn't right. And then when you get away from it and you're looking in, you're like, that wasn't right. Like, yeah. I know what I was talking about. Look how messed up this is. And look at all these other guys that are still, man, I feel for the, the ones that want to get out. That um, can't? Beca- because, dude, I was the same way. Like, It's so discouraging when you're in and you're applying at jobs that you know you can do well. Yeah. And you don't even get a call back. And then four years go by. And you've never gotten a call back, and then you get that one call, and it's it's life changing. Yeah. Um, like I said, it's a great profession, full of great people, but it sometimes when you feel like it's time to go, it's time to go. And I, while we're having this conversation, I want to encourage anybody that's listening, um, that that wants to get out. Um, they even they even have. Um, I know I've seen a couple of them on LinkedIn. They have organizations that like help cops transfer um, out of the profession because I'm telling you, like, if you're listening to this and you feel like you're stuck, I mean, you're not stuck. Call us. Call, yeah, give us a call <laughs> because, I mean, there are things – and it, it's going to take work. I'm not saying it's easy, dude. It's not easy. Like, well, and one thing you have to realize, too, is once you get to a certain point in your law enforcement career, you're making okay money mm-hmm. for the job that you're doing. It's never a good amount of money. But it's it's to a point where it's like, in order to get out, I got to go back to the bottom, right? Yeah. And Nobody I to do that. I happened to find find something that was close. It was a little cut, but it was close enough that I could survive with it, knowing that the ceiling was much higher. Mm-hmm. Um, and man, it was a rough rough patch getting out and starting new. Uh, but it was scary too. It's so scary, but everybody's like, oh my God, I don't have civil service protection. Like if they want you gone, you're gone. Yeah. You know? Going back to leadership, um, 
and I, I want to make it clear before I, I talk about this uh, specific topic. I'm not about kicking people when they're down. I'm not about revenge. Um, there was a time where I was about revenge. I, I would have to, you know, I would be lying to anybody listening to me and just try and paint a, a picture of myself that isn't true. There was a time where I, where I did want revenge and I had, and then a you learn it's not worth your energy. Yes. And I had a lot of hate in my heart and I had to get out of that place. That's a dark place. It's a terrible place to be in just mentally and, 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 and in your everyday life. So never do I want somebody to think I am after any kind of revenge, especially with this next topic, because this next topic kind of hits close to home. It's going back to leadership, but it hits close to home with me. Um, this is just a perfect example. Um, clear as day as to what a lot of leadership in our profession is. So backstory on this. Um, the video that I'm about to show you is one of my ex-police chiefs, uh, Andy Harvey. He was arrested on Sunday for allegedly um, abusing 911, the 911 service, and allegedly resisting arrest. Um, Andy should be afforded the same rights as anybody else, innocent until proven guilty. Um, but there are some things that led up to this arrest. Uh, he was my chief. Like this dude, I mean, swore you in. Yes. Like, look, I'm going to show this picture. I don't think you can see it, Jason, but uh, my audience can see it. Like, this is me. Um, this is literally me holding up his book, Excellence in Policing. And um, of course, that was a forced picture. I'm not going to lie, but um, it, it was a photo op for his uh, uh, for his LinkedIn. But um, this guy wrote this book that's used by a lot of people, and I want to I want to play this video first. Okay, I want to play the video first, and then we'll I, I want to talk about it. Yesterday, former FAR Police Chief Andrew Harvey was arrested and charged with resisting arrest and silent abusive call electric communication to a 911 service. This morning, District 1 Councilmember Gilbert Gonzalez, who opposed Harvey as the LPD chief, says the council got it right. If the city was to was caught in the situation, Councilmember Gonzalez says that they would have had to open up the position again at taxpayers' expense. The councilman also shared what he thought were red flags or warning signs with potentially choosing Harvey. Well, first of all, he didn't he didn't hold a job. He wasn't he was unemployed. And the last uh, job he had, he had been there just two years and two months. So he was very inconsistent. Okay, so a little timeline here on um Andy Harvey. Um he did he did 21 years with Dallas Police Department. Um in 2019 uh no, excuse me, 2017, he comes to be the chief of police in Palestine, Texas. I go back to work in Palestine um in 2018, he's the chief at the time. So in 2019, so he's only been there 2 years roughly. 2019 he begins the search uh, for another police chief job. Um, why that is, I don't know. Um, so he begins to search for another police chief job. In 2019, uh, he applied at several different places, a couple of places he got denied, but um, that year he does become the police chief in Ennis, Texas uh, in December. So December of 2019, and then December, excuse me, July of 2020, it's a few months, um, not even six months. He goes to be the police chief in Far, Texas, which is um, out near the border. It's far. Yeah, far. It's <laughs> far away. So then um, he's there in 2020, and in 2022, he becomes the city manager and the police chief at the same time of this city. Um. Some people don't see a problem with that. I know some really good guys right now that are doing that. Um, but I just think it's a conflict of interest, in my opinion. 
Um, so he becomes city manager. Now listen, in August of 2022, he is the city manager and the police chief. He gets into an argument with Ed Wiley, who to my understanding, Ed Wiley um, was the deputy city manager at the time. So uh, basically like assistant chief, deputy city manager, second in charge. Um, apparently there was a check that was written for some amount of money to some to some local business. Um, Harvey didn't like it. And I want to play this video. What happens is the sit, there is so much yelling going on um, in City Hall on the fourth floor that the city administration, the secretary, calls the police. And when the police show up... Call the police on the police. They call the police on okay. the police. Yeah. And this is what happens. This is body cam footage. Again, August of 22, when the police officer rolls up to City Hall. Did you call? I did, but I thought it was somebody from the outside. It's it's management. They're getting into it. Where? In the back, but Where? It's back there. Can I come in? Okay, come on. It's clean. Yeah? Just the heat. Who the fuck called you? Chief. Who called you? They called me from the... Uh, no, 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 go back. Yes, sir. You need your fucking help. Yes, sir. Who the fuck called that? All right, so the voice that you heard there, and I put a, I put a warning on this podcast, especially after last week, but you know, there's some language in there. However, what you hear there is Andy Harvey. This guy is the police chief, city manager, and you can hear, um, if you really, really paid attention, and and you can rewind this and play this later if you didn't hear it, but as the police officer's walking up, you hear him say, I am your effing boss, and then door slams. And he he's walking down the hallway, and then that's where um, that officer, apparently his name is Nick, Nick sees Andy in the hallway, and he's like, who the F called you? You know, get out. And he's doing this in front of city administrators, um, you know, secretaries, all these employees. And this is a guy who... So, And what police officers trained to deal with that? Okay, so listen, I read the investigation. Um, it's on the internet. You can find it. I read the investigation. Um, it, was, it, was, it was the... Um, I believe it was the city attorney and HR... Who did the who did this investigation? It's like a six page ordeal, and so I read the investigation. And in the investigation, they are giving this guy Nick can't remember his last name. They are giving him hell about his response. They were like, "Why, you know, if well, you, of course, yeah, because the guy that's causing all the problems is the city manager who manages HR, right?" And they, they want to know, why didn't you deal with that? Why, um, if you can't handle situations that are stressful like that, that involve, you know, your boss, how are you going to go? They were just giving him hell about it. I feel so bad for that guy because what he do you could, do? There's no way he could win. What do there's you do? zero things he could have done to win that situation. Exactly, dude. Like, he has his boss who is obviously amped up. What the F are you doing here? Get out of here. And you hear him. He's like, oh, yes, sir. You know. What do you say to that? Like, what do you do? Yeah. And they're sitting there giving him hell about that during that investigation. It kind of made me a little mad because I'm like, come on, man. Like, what what do you want him to do? What would you do if if you were in that position? And so... Because um, if he took any action, oh, do you think he'd still be a cop there right no. now? No. He'd be on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. He'd be on this podcast. So you're exactly right. Yeah. Um, so this was August of 22. Um. Shortly after that, and I don't have the audio, it's all on the internet. Shortly after that, uh, Harvey resigns as the, um, he resigns the city manager portion of it. He goes before city management, it's like, hey, it's too much, whatever. Then literally, um, like a week later, 
he resigns fully. And so he's, you know, he's he's done with 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 the city of Far. Bizarrely and oddly enough, the man runs for mayor of Far in 2023, February of 2023. He 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 puts in papers to be mayor. Where he literally just did this and and you know I'm sure that was a successful campaign. No, actually it wasn't. Um obviously he lost. Now in twenty twenty three um, just a few months ago, he, this was an ongoing deal. He puts in to be the police chief of Laredo Police Department. He wants to be their police chief. And in the first video I played, you heard him. You, that was a city council member say, "Hey, we're glad that we, you know, this didn't happen because on Sunday, the man gets arrested for silent or abusive call to nine one one." And um, resisting arrest. I don't know the story behind that. I'm assuming right now somebody's probably doing some open records and we'll get more information on that. My point to all this, I'm I'm driving it home. Um, This is a guy, and I have this book with me. I want to show everybody here. You saw it a minute ago. Excellence in Policing. This is a guy who claims to be you know, just this amazing leader. And I will say, listen, I do have to give the man credit when he when when he was my chief. He was very um he came in and he did some good things within the Palestine Police Department. Um he did change a culture that was very sick. Um he changed the culture so much he I mean they made me want to come back. I think it was all under, you know, predicated on BS, but I still came back. Um and I did see some good things. However, you have a guy like this who's traveling the country writing books that – did you say that you've taught out of this book? Mm-hmm. Who, who, who people are teaching out of, you know, on a college level of, hey, this is what – this is how you are to be a leader. And the problem with this is I'm not, you know – Again, people make mistakes. I'm not sitting here saying that people cannot make mistakes because mistakes happen. But to me, if you're this far advanced to where you are an author, you are or police chief, um, you are a city manager, you should be able to control and have emotional intelligence. And obviously in that video there at City Hall, um, all emotional intelligence was gone. Well, as they teach us in the academy, when your emotions are high, your rational thought is low. The only way you're going to have high rational thought is when you get your emotions under control and, and lower that. Exactly. We all we all know it. Yep. We've all been taught it. Uh, it's just a matter of practicing it. And so here's the deal. This this guy taught Mark Harkrow, the next chief, how to be a police chief. And look at the results from that. I mean— Listen to the first five, six, whatever, seven episodes of my podcast and look at the results of that. And this is what I'm talking about. Toxic generational leadership that that's what's being pushed down from generation to generation, from chief to chief. And and it, it doesn't apply to everyone. No, absolutely but, not. But a decent chunk. A decent chunk because um, going back to what I said earlier, I have not personally worked for a decent police chief except for one time. I talk about him all the time, Chief Rob Vine. Like that man to me was a leader. And he wasn't a wannabe. He wasn't out here. I wish he'd write a book because, I mean, it would sell. But, you know, guys like this are just for fluff and appearance. And it's all about what it looks like versus what it really is. I've had three chiefs, two good, one bad. And the last chief I had, the first week I was there, he was shagging calls in the middle of the night because patrol was overwhelmed. And then we get into an incident where we've got someone trying to jump off a bridge and we we get them off the bridge and we're, we're wrestling with them on the ground. And I look up and the police chief, like badge number one is running down the road to come help us. Like, I was like, well, that's cool. I've never seen that. That's, that's servant. That's servant leadership. And he was a great chief. Um, 
and I would, if he was still in the profession, I'd work for him again. Yeah. Uh, but guys but like that, are not all like that. Guys like that are rare men, servant leadership, leading from the top, doing, doing what you're asking everybody else to do. You know, a lot of people just think they get to that point to where I've made it. You know, I'm here. Just do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. Uh, and do it the way I say it. And they lost touch with what it's like to be yeah. on the street or in CID or whatever the case may be. They've lost touch of those realities and they're trying to lead and they forgot where they've started or where they've been. And then there's guys who, honestly, who, some guys hadn't even been there and they're in leadership roles, you know? I mean, it's, it's all about do what's right always. Treat your people right and stick to the core values that we all swore to when we took the job. Yeah. Stick to that because they become disconnected from that after some point of time. And then they start doing things for themselves. And that's where you get the toxic leadership. No, I agree, man. Um, and, and that's why, you know, having these conversations, um, having people like you who've experienced it, that way, because if if we can affect change by having these conversations, I don't know who watches this. I mean, I, I get to see my my numbers kind of behind the scenes sometimes. Um, some weeks they're high, some weeks they're low. It just kind of depends. But I don't know who exactly is out there watching this and paying attention. But what I do know is if they if we can affect change from this table right here, you know, and take it further and beyond. It's going to – we can fix the mistrust. It's better for our communities. It's better for our families, our children, because – And I mean, it would better the police service that you get. Absolutely. 100%. Um, I, I mean, my kids say all the time, like, my kids have heard conversations, um, you know – They've kind of seen what's happened to me. Uh, you know, they're kind of getting older. I've had to answer some really hard questions. And those aren't things that I should even have to, you know, they they just, they 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 see police officers as, as just, you know, respectable, um, moral, authoritative figures, you know. And that's how, I mean, that's how it's really supposed to be, right? Um, to an extent, but when you have to tell them, Hey, you know, why did you leave? Why, you know, and trying to explain those things to them in, 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 in kids terms is really hard. Um, and I've had to do it, man. And it, it's, it's unfortunate and I, I hate that I've had to do it, but, um, man, the whole point to just affect change from right here with people like you, um, and I hope, man, my hope is just to try and get more people out here on this show that are willing to sit down and talk um, and have open dialogue. It doesn't have to be one side towards the other. I think we all have a common goal. Our mission is to, like you said, um, do what's right always. And always. When we mess up. Not because, when it's convenient, but always. Right. When we mess up and when we screw up, because it's inevitably going to happen because we are human beings. Going back to being vulnerable and saying, okay, we screwed up. Let's get it right. Well, yeah, you you know, in the private sector, you always look for the root cause. Mm -hmm. That's that's what you do when you're trying to fix a problem. What's the root cause and how do you fix that root cause? But I think historically it's just a matter of like on to the next one. Instead of trying to fix the root cause, let's just get rid of the cause yeah. and not fix the root. Jason, I, I, I don't think it translates. Man, I appreciate you coming on tonight. Um, Wish it was cooler in here, but yeah, yeah, it's it is great. a little, it is a little warm. I'm, I'm glad uh, Zork, the producer, opened that door because I mean it is warm. Yeah, but man, I appreciate it, dude. Um, I, 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 uh, I know you were a little hesitant at first, but um, I think we had good conversation. Um, people out here that are listening to this, um, I hope it, I hope it does bring change. Um, I think you're gonna start making major progress when you start putting people on here that says current law enforcement. Yeah. Some, someone that's not afraid to put their title out there in their, their department and actually be candid about it. I think that's when you're going to really start driving change. And, but and, at the end of the day, like 
we can push change all we want, but you have to want to change yeah. for the change to work. And you can't make a horse drink water. And I mean, it's, it's a stubborn profession. So. And that, and that is, that's my point. What, what is wrong? What is wrong with somebody? Why would a department or a city sheriff's office, county, whatever, why would, why they, would they not want to do, why better? would they not want to do this? What is this going? What is this going What's to it do? Gonna hurt? This is going to, if we can, like you said, get current law enforcement here at this table. That's why I want to get Chief Garcia here. I'm going to try. I don't know if he's going to do it, but I'm going to try. And I'm, you know, but if I was a gambling man with you right now, I would say that he would do it. Yeah. Uh, Cause he seems like that kind of guy. He does. Yeah. And, and, and it's guys like that, man, like those kind of guys who are, who are trying to get it right. You know, I think the, is the whole thing is if we're putting forth our best effort with good intentions, with the constitution at the forefront of our, of, of what we're doing and people's best interests at the forefront of the decisions that we're making. Of course, like I said, we're inevitably going to screw up, but if, if, those are the things that we're thinking about when we are out here making our decisions as law enforcement officers. I think you're going to do more right than you are wrong. You're going to cause, you're going to have more good than harm. Well, it's like we always say, you know, the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing repetitively, expecting a different result. If you want your department to be the best and you want to be respected and you want to have a good relationship with the public, it starts from within. The department that I, work for now um we had a staff meeting this morning and that was one of the things um that i that we we talked about we have some really good people there um and that's one of the reasons why i got back in the profession was to especially on an administrative level because we talked about that you can actually really try and and do some good from the top um but we talked about that today of uh being different um and not just saying those words, not just being at a round table, having our little notepads out, but actually changing the culture from the top. And I and I told them, I said, you know, the chief of police sitting right there, I said, and, you know, he agreed. It starts at this table. Yes. The Like the conversations we are having in this leadership staff meeting, it starts right here because they have to see it in us. And we have to go out, and when we show our faces, they have to they have to believe in what they see. And if we're faking it, if we're, you know, if we act like we don't care, how are they going to care? And so it starts, I mean, like you said, it just starts at the top. And that, that was, again, my motivation for getting back in the profession on an administrative level, because I will never... Ever, you will never see me um, beaten, beaten, a, a, a chasing calls, chasing calls, no. and not, not, not. There's what, nothing wrong with nothing it. wrong with it's that. It's just we did it. We did. We, we, we did it. it. And I don't think if I were to go to an agency now, if I were to go to Dallas PD and start all over from the very bottom, and I was out here in South Dallas, you know, beating calls. Can I make a difference? You know, that that's a... The answer is no. You can make a difference for a dozen people a day. Right. Right? Well, but you're not going to make a major no, impact. absolutely not. It's the leadership that makes a big difference. Yes. And that's why I told you at dinner, like, I love the profession. I miss it tremendously. But the only way I would ever go back is in a leadership role so that I can actually make a difference. Because there have been too many times in my career where I've had great ideas to fix things. And they're like, ah, I just worry about your job. Exactly. And it's like, this is a good idea. You know? a, yeah. They don't, they think. That's the only way I would go back. They don't want to listen to that. And and man, do I miss working investigations. I know. It it was my passion. It, it's, it was the highlight of my career. The unit that I was in was elite. I learned a lot from those guys. But man. I, and you're good at it too, man. You're yeah. a hell of an investigator. Um, hell of a detective. And I'll be honest, man, the profession, um, when they, when guys like you get out and there's hundreds more of you, good people, good cops that want to do the job for the right reasons, 
and we're losing them by the dozens right now because we are not allowed to have conversations like this. And I'm going to be frank. Nailed it. I'm a very frank person. If my employer came to me tomorrow and said I couldn't do this, I'd quit because I'm so passionate about this profession and what it needs to be that if you're going to tell me I can no longer do this, I'm just the kind of guy that's going to quit. Hey, sorry, I'm not a good fit for your agency. You obviously don't want change for yourself. Or you don't culture. want change for this organization. You don't want change for the culture of law enforcement as a whole. And I'm out. That's exactly what my answer would be. But, but based on the staff meeting that you had today, I'm willing to bet that it's not like that there. No. And you know what? Um, it's it's kind of uh, interesting that um, <laughs> I, I know that they know about this. Um I think it's so fresh and it's so new. Like, I don't know if anybody's doing this in this entire country. I don't know. Um, I haven't seen it. Um, I'm in a lot of groups. I know a lot of people. I've seen a lot of things, but I don't think anybody's doing this. So this is so fresh and so new. It's kind of like, you know, taking your toe and you're just dipping it in the water, just kind of seeing, you know, what it's going to do. But, um, I mean, I'm be doing cannonballs before too long. You know, that's my goal is because this is exactly what it's going to take is is these kind of conversations with current law enforcement, former law enforcement, prosecutors, you know, from from federal all the way down to state. And um, I got big goals for this for this podcast. And it's it's just a grind. Um, It doesn't come without its challenges. But um, having I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that you decided to come on. Um. Because I think you bring value, you bring perspective, and um, I know there are a lot of law enforcement listens to this show, but there's also a lot of law enforcement that doesn't. So trying to give those people in our communities some perspective, like, hey, we're not we're not bad guys, man. I can't tell you, I've got uh, comments by the thousands on my TikToks. I kind of there's so many of them, I can't even keep up with them sometimes. But people just, man, they they are so hateful towards law enforcement. I got flipped off just for driving a police car to work one day. Like I was doing nothing. Yeah. You know, um, one of the last, literally the, one of the last two weeks, uh, somebody followed me home. Didn't even know it. Bad cop move. Uh, didn't mm. even know it. Somebody followed me home, called and complained that I was going five over the speed limit on one fourteen on my way home from work. And I'm like, sorry, I was going five over. I just, left a murder scene where a 90 year old lady got stabbed to death. Like, give me a break. You yeah, know? man. Cut, cut the people some slack because you don't know what they're dealing with. You don't know the call they went to before they came to your house. They're genuinely there to try to help you. If you do something wrong, just own it. Well, that's the thing. It's, it's so, so simple. Some of these people have such jaded opinion of the police because, um, that there have been some police officers that didn't do us any favors, right? Well, I mean, they, yeah, dude. I, and I, I keep, they're I, bad. I always go back to this. Richard Miles, dude, that man, I told him when he said here, I said, you were one of the most humble. I can't believe you were so humble. I would be mad at the freaking world. And just his attitude and his demeanor and how forgiving he was from his situation. But, man, there's people. Um, I'm in touch with some of these innocent projects. I plan to have more people on that, that um, you know, have been exonerated and things. But the numbers for those things are just higher than they should be because it just all it starts with us man it literally starts with us and and i can't blame some of these people for having some of the opinions that they have but we got us we got to start nobody's starting and we got to start so i'm glad that you came on dude um hell of a conversation i've been enjoying visiting with you and uh, maybe i get you back on sometime yeah if you get chief garcia i want to come back i will i'll bring you on for it (laughs) um Guys, listen, remember, um, I always say this, you have to share this, you have to like it, Um, tell your friends, tell your family, because as we've said here tonight, this is the only way that we are going to make the change. And even if you're not in law enforcement, I promise you, at this table, having these conversations, this is the only way that we are going to start change, is by having these conversations and so like share follow um youtube twitter x um instagram i mean you name it i'm on all the platforms um 
Apple, Spotify, um, got my website, thisisfailingjustice.com. Go there, give it a like, um, give it a visit, and um, tune in next week. Um, podcast is going to be on Wednesday next week. I have a prior commitment on Tuesday. So um, tune in um, next week for the Failing Justice podcast. Thanks for joining. Jason, once again, man, thanks for being here. Thanks, man. And uh, you guys have a good night. This is Failing Justice.